the revelation of Jesus Christ to his servant John for the churches. Lesson 1 of 26, an introduction to the book. Revelation 1, 1 through 3 by Ellis Jones. 1 through 8, rather. Revelation 1, 1 through 8. First eight verses, that's what this lesson is about. Plus a lot of introductory material I want to give you. Revelation 1, 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. So Jesus got this, God, Jesus gave, got permission from God to reveal this to, and so God knows everything. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't know when he was going to come again and when the end of the world would be. So he doesn't know, he, all he knows about the future is what God tells him. Because, of course, God has told him a lot of things and probably almost everything now. God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Okay, the beginning, the beginning of the prophecies would start very soon. In fact, as soon as uh, John had written it, as soon as Domitian, the emperor at the time, as soon as he died, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Now, this angel is the one who does the revealing. God, God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the angel. The angel gave it to John. John gave it to us. So. This angel throughout the book is the one who's doing all the revealing. There are many angels that are mentioned in here, but this particular angel is the one who creates the visions and leads John in his uh, quest, in his revelation. John, who testifies to everything he saw, so John is a witness also who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John testifies to this, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The words come from him and uh, ultimately from God. Blessed is the one who reads the word to this prophecy. Now the word uh, reads there is uh, from the Greek word anagonosko, which means to read aloud. Back in those days, few people, not very many people could read, I don't think. I don't know, I didn't live back there, so I don't, and I read the histories, and I got the idea that not a whole lot of people could read, and they didn't have books to read in the first place because they were so expensive. And the Bibles, there weren't very many Bibles, even the Old Testament, which the people had at the time, they didn't have the New Testament. But the Old Testament was very rare and scarce, and not every church had a copy. But when they did, somebody in the church would be, would be designated to make a copy for that church. And this is what they did when they came to John on Patmos, the angels of the churches, which were actually the messengers because the Greek word Angelos actually means a messenger. Uh, there's supernatural messengers and there's earthly messengers. John the Baptist was called a messenger. And in uh, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 8, I believe it's called the messengers of the churches. So <clears throat> an angel can be a messenger who reads, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Some versions say, heed, heed what is written here, which means actually to obey it. There's things in here that we must obey. The time is near. The time that it's beginning, the beginning of the fulfillment is near, not the end of time. Revelation 1, 4 through 8. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Now there are as many more than 10 actually as many at least as many as 10 in the province of Asia which is a Roman province it's not the continent of Asia it's not talking about Asia Minor it's not talking about the whole area of what is now we know as Turkey it was the along the western coast there and it was a Roman province just like Judea was a Roman province and Achaia was a Roman province so this was a Roman province called Asia Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now who is talking here? Who are talking? So uh, it says uh, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from, okay so it says later in verse 5 and from Jesus so the first one here who speaks is probably God the Father, the one who it was, who is and was, who and to come, and from seven, the seven spirits. Seven is the universal number, number of completeness. Since the creation, creation was completed in 
six days and the seventh day rested and that's, that finished the period of creation. So seven, seven churches, seven trumpets, seven vows, uh, bowls of wrath of God, the seven this and seven that. So seven is a symbolic number which represents completeness. The seven spirits before his throne is the, the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So the Trinity is speaking here. God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus. And it's described him as a faithful witness. We can depend on everything he says. Just like God, he doesn't lie. The firstborn from the dead, the first one to be raised from the dead in a bodily form and not to die again and to be changed into a glorious body and to go to heaven. First, he was the first of that. Uh, Lazarus, other people were raised from the dead but they died again. Uh, Enoch wasn't raised from the dead, he was translated. He's a ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, sometimes you wonder what kind of ruling he's doing of the kings of the earth right now, the chaos we see in the world. But Jesus knows what he's doing, and he has to let us learn, sometimes the hard way. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So this is praise. John's seeing, seeing, and dedicating this book to Jesus who has loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom. Some versions say kings and priests, but the correct translation is a kingdom. He's made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him, that is to Jesus, be glory and power forever and ever, amen. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Uh, the coming, the second coming of Jesus is not gonna be a secret rapture. There's not gonna be a rapture. Well, there'll be a rapture, we'll be caught up but it won't be secret. And everybody, all Christians, will be caught up at the same time, and then right after that will be the destruction of the world, not a seven-year tribulation, which we'll talk about that when the time comes. Even those who pierced him, which means he, everyone from, at, from Adam and Eve and all the way, all, every generation is going to be there. They're going to be raised from the dead. They're going to look up and they're going to see Jesus. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. We're hoping that every single individual is not going to be mourning. I hope I don't be, I'm not mourning at the time, but there'll be a lot of people on this earth going to be mourning because their sins are not forgiven. And when they see Jesus coming, they, they know enough to know what's going to happen to them. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, is that Jesus? Does it sound like the one who said the same kind of thing in uh, the other the other verse? The Almighty sound like the Father, God the Father. Here we have a picture of uh, supposedly the Roman Empire. The beast that came up out of the sea and so forth, now the land. In the uh, book of Daniel, that's where this comes from, the symbolism. There were four great empires that were re represented by four animals. And this is the Roman Empire. He has the body of a leopard, feet of a bear, and he has a head of a lion. And uh, this is artist re artist rendition. And uh, the four, seven has seven heads, and it probably represents Egypt, Assyria, Bab uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So. Uh, and, the, and the Holy Roman Empire, which came later and became a, another, another empire based on Rome and, and uh, the image of Rome. So anyway, this is the artist's rendition of that. Unless the Bible itself gives the meaning of a symbol, neither I nor anyone else can be certain of its interpretation. The meaning I assign to the symbol not explained by the Bible, that is, are my best educated guesses and not to be taken as more than that. I have tried to understand the things, these things, but there's always a chance I could be mistaken. I was mistaken one time. I thought I was, but I was mistaken. 
this picture is inaccurate because the heads were supposed to represent the seven great world empires that ruled the nation of Israel before the Roman, one including the Roman. The Roman Empire combined the attributes of all the others. So the, com the combination is the Roman Empire, not any particular animal, but the combination of all of them is, represents the Roman Empire. There he is, in all his glory. Seven heads, ten horns, with crowns on his horns, because they represent European kings. Therefore, the heads of the Egyptian Nile crocodile, which the Bible didn't really say that, but I, that's what I think. I think it's Egypt was the first of the great heads. The Assyrian, or the long-haired, bearded man. Then the Babylonian lion, which was accurately shown. The Medo-Persian bear, the feet, the feet are there and the Macedonian Grecian he-goat and it's also shown to be a leopard in one, one of the visions so the leopard is there and uh, it was depicted the composite beast and the seven heads together represent the Roman Empire and the horns the European kingdoms that later came from the great empire okay something about the pictures as we just saw, the pictures I've used on the slides do not always accurately represent the true appearance of things mentioned in the text, but they're the best I can find. These pictures have nearly all come from the internet, from a search on Google, the search engine, searching the, in the Google images. Please do not think these pictures came from the Bible itself or from the mind of God. The Bible didn't have, to have any artist representation of anything. Concerning prophecy, <clears throat> there's a tendency today to avoid the study of prophecy. The excuse is that we should spend most of our time studying things that, quote, unquote, have a practical application. Many think prophecy has no practical application. This is far from the truth. If prophecy were not important, God would not have had so much of it written. I think the real reason some avoid it is that it requires intensive study more time and effort than most of us are willing to give to it. Here we have a picture of Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel. Do we have contempt for prophecy? If we have contempt for prophecy, we have contempt for God, isn't that right? Don't treat prophecy with contempt, said the apostle. But that is what many of us do. It's true, there seem to be many different and confusing interpretations. But the person who wants to invest some time into the study will be amply rewarded with more faith and hope. After all, that's why prophecies were given, to give us more faith and hope. Here we have a Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the giant man made of four, five different kinds of metals. What each of those meant. The gold, Babylonian, Medio Persian, silver, Grecian, brass, bronze. Roman Empire, iron, Holy Roman Empire, iron and clay. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the Holy Prophet, said Peter. Do you recall the words? Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Have we been taught by all, all the things that have been written in the past, including prophecy? What do the prophetic words teach us? To endure, to have courage, and hope. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and those who hear it and those who take to heart what is written in it. Here we have what we call a book in some versions, a scroll in others. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, meaning the gospel. The prophetic, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing, when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you 
when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels longed to look into these things. These prophets gave the prophecies, but they didn't understand what they were saying. They were just speaking from God through the Holy Spirit. Here Joseph was a prophet, and he was explaining Pharaoh's dream, which was all in symbol, like the book of Revelation. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now what's the morning star? That's Jesus, the information that we have about Jesus. Who he is, what he is, what he did. Above what he's going to do. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's what we call inspiration. Here we have the prophet looking looking to the future. The apocalypse, you heard that word. That's a, a name sometimes given to the book of Revelation. The title in the original language, which is Greek, Apocalypsis is a compound of apo, which means off, and calypsis, which means a covering, a veil, a curtain, a cover. The compound word means uncovered, that is, revealed. The revelation is therefore a good title for the book. Although the book is largely symbols, it is still a revelation for those that know and understand the Old Testament prophecies. Well, when, once you decode it, it's revealed. You see the codes, you have to figure out what the codes mean. Once you figure that out and uncode it, then it's hard to explain to someone else, but maybe you understand it. Faces of the cherubim. Cherubim is plural. Cherub is singular. The ox face is not seen. There were four cherubim around the heavenly throne. You see the ox horns on the other side. Apocalyptic, the adjective, how is that used? The adjective apocalyptic is not used in the Bible, but is commonly used today to mean a great catastrophe. It's also used to describe people, a prophetic literature that uses many symbols to predict future events, as do the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation, and even some parts of other books, as in the Gospels, as in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So, these are apocalyptic books. Is that an apocalyptic flood? I don't think so. It's a maybe it's a biblical flood. A flood of biblical proportions, perhaps. That's how this adjective is used. The term biblical is sometimes used in the same sense, such as a storm or flood of biblical proportions. The idea conveyed by both terms, ap apocalyptic and biblical, is that the cal calamities described in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, are worse than any seen in nature, when something is beyond what the scope of nature, or we think it look looks as if it is, we say it's apocalyptic or biblical, biblical proportion. Armageddon. Now what does that mean? How is that used? Among the terms from the Revelation in common use today is the word Armageddon. <clears throat> to mean a nuclear holocaust or some other form of violent catastrophe. But this word has a specific meaning in the Revelation. It refers to the defeat of the papal power by the word of God. In other words, it's the uh, Reformation and then the, re re the Restoration. In other words, it's really a spiritual war won by Jesus when his true church is restored. Here we have uh, the seven churches of Asia there on the left. The, uh, west end of Asia Minor in the province, the Roman province of Asia, not that whole area that we know as Turkey today, but there was a smaller province on the western end of that Asia Minor that was called the province of Asia. And there were at least ten churches there. Seven of them were chosen to be to represent the universal church because of the number, the number is symbolic. What is revealed in the book? It's revelation, so what is revealed? What is revealed, the future events that would affect the church, came from God to Jesus, 
then to the angel, then to John, then to the seven churches, who are us. Remember I said the whole book was written to the seven churches, not just the letters. The seven churches symbolize the universal church of Christ, or the church in all the world, in every generation, to the end of time. I do not subscribe to the idea that the Ephesian church, the church that lost its first love, represents the church of the first century, and the Laodicean church represents the church at the end of time. I do not subscribe to that idea. Here we see John, ready to receive and write down what he sees in the revelation, the testimony of Jesus Christ, revealed by the angel. Jesus revealed to his servants what he wanted them to know. He got permission from God, gave it to the angel, the angel gave it to John, John gave it to us. He asked God for permission to reveal certain things he felt the church must know. God gave him those things. He sent a single angel who revealed everything recorded in the book to John who wrote them down in the last year of the mission. Remember John was exiled to this island until Domitian died then he could go back to Ephesus where he was ministering and he's buried there. The revelation came as, se as seven sets of seven visions. It's a book of sevens. John was on the island of Patmos to receive the prophecy. Here we see him again, another artist's rendition. What is revealed in the book continued. What is revealed in the book is the future of the Universal Church from 96 AD to the end of time and beyond. The beginning of the fulfillment of these prophecies was near. The revelation is couched in a code or symbol, symbolic language that only those who are willing to obey his commandments will understand and most likely after the event predicted has been fulfilled. Sir Isaac Newton the great scientist. Sir Isaac Newton, famous for his discoveries in physics, was also an astute student of prophecy. With his statement on the purpose of prophecy, I fully agree. Speaking of the revelation to John, he says, He, that is God, gave this and the prophecies of the Old Testament not to gratify men's curiosities by enabling them to foreknow things, but that after they were fulfilled they might be interpreted by the event by the fulfillment that is and his own providence not the interpreters be, be then manifested thereby to the world in the quotation in other words the prophecy was given so that after it was fulfilled men might see that to, after the events they wouldn't have understood the fulfillment until they lived through these events but when they looked at the events and seen that they were prophesied in advance, then they knew that God knew what he was talking about. His, the word of God is inspired, so they served as a, as a they served as a miracles, a miracle of mind to prove the word of God. We see the modern day merchandisers in prophecy concocting all sorts of fanciful scenarios and writing a whole series of books based on surmises and guesses, most of which I believe are based on misinterpretations and the rejection of the true purpose of prophecy. Chapter 1, The Introduction Even if we were not told the book was composed mostly of symbols, the Bible says it's signified, we would, know, we would know it from the fact that no literal interpretation can explain much of what is written therein. Although it is a book of symbols, there is probably no symbol in the book that was not previously introduced elsewhere in scriptures, in the prophetic books in the Old Testament, mostly. Jesus is pictured in sets of symbols that show that he is in control of his church on earth and is his judge and protector. Notice the Son of Man riding on his white horse with the Word of God written on his thigh with a great sword proceeding from his mouth which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Given to be heard head over all things to the church. Also ruler over the governments of the earth. 
Ruler over the natural world, he created it and will bring it to its end. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah Purposes The book was written to show that Jesus' ultimate victory is assured. If we remain in him, our ultimate victory is also assured. We must persevere in the face of persecution and even death for him. The incremental and cumulative fulfillment of prophecies through time, some part in each generation, takes the place of living miracle workers, improving the inspiration of the Bible and the foreknowledge of God. That is the purpose of prophecy. Here we have another view of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. We see the Sword of the Spirit. We see the easy Alpha and Omega. We see the Star of David. We see the fish, the Ixus, which means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. We see many other things. It's Jesus on his throne with an open book in his hand. We see the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Lamb and the Lion. Many things there that represent Jesus. A very good picture. Fulfilled prophecy was to take the place of living prophets and miracle workers in the years after they ceased. Since the prophecies are written in the code that only those who are willing to obey Jesus will understand, the enemies of Christ will not understand. This was also true of Jesus' parables. As the saving, as the saying goes, hindsight is 2020, and I believe the prophecies were not given to warn or prevent events from occurring, but to serve as proofs after the fact. If we could use prophecies to prevent something from happening, then we would say, well, we were, we were able to thwart God's plan. That's never going to happen. His slave, John. The word doulos is used by John of himself, and the word is slave, sometimes translated bondservant. If we are Christians, Jesus owns us, body and soul. We were enslaved to Satan as sinners. Jesus paid his own blood. He bought us. We are blood-bought. Blood he gave his blood as our redemption price. Now we belong to him. Freedom is a relative term. We are freed from the bondage of sin and death and serve willingly our chosen master. To us, that is freedom. Within the bonds, bounds of God's law, we have wide latitude and independent choices. That is true freedom, protected freedom. Testimony of John. What John writes is what he, what he personally heard and saw. So he's a witness to the prophecy, the revelation of the prophecy. The second witness, as the law requires, is a fulfilled prophecy which will prove to be the testimony of God in the Spirit. The prophecies then the prophecies then are miracles of the mind that convince those who have ears to hear and are willing to heed and keep or obey the things that are written here. Another miracle of mind. Another miracle of mind or proof of the supernatural authorship of the book is its amazing design and organization. The book has a beauty of composition that had to require a higher than human intelligence to create such a masterpiece of literature, though it is more than just beautiful prose. But of course, the chief indicator of its divine authorship are the fulfillments of its detailed predictions. Here's the island of Patmos where you can see a fairly large ship in the harbor and a lot of houses, buildings in and around the harbor and up on the hillsides, even high up on some of the mountains there around there. Changed a lot since John's time, I'm sure. Seven Beatitudes. There are seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation or blessings pronounced on those who do this, those who do that. The first of seven Beatitudes or blessings pronounced on those who do certain things is in verse 3. Blessed is he who reads, remember reads aloud, and those who hear the words of the prophecy 
and heed or obey the things which are written in it, for the time is near. The word for reads actually means reads aloud, as I said. In those days, the few people had their own copy of any book of scripture. Someone had to read it to them. And uh, they didn't, a lot of people couldn't read in those days. They weren't educated. And uh, they didn't have many books. Most churches didn't have their own Bible, the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet, or at least the churches hadn't received their copy yet. So uh, they had to have someone, and this person was called a messenger, or the angel of the church. They came to John, they got their copy, they went back to their churches. Heeds means obeys. Have you heard someone say, you don't need to study this book in depth because it just tells us that we win in the end and that's all we need to know about the book. To hear talk like that is disconcerting to me. It's true that we do win in the end. But every chapter and verse is meant to be read aloud and paid attention to by every Christian. There's nothing unimportant here. The time is near. The beginning of the fulfillment of these things was ready to happen shortly. Other phrases say these are things that must soon come to pass. The word translated soon can also mean shortly, quickly, or suddenly unannounced, imminent. When applied to Jesus, many comings promised in the book, as I will come quickly and remove your lampstand, etc. This just means any sudden personal action by Jesus, not the end of the world. Here we have listed the seven churches of Asia. And we have them over there, stars representing them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven. Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Ephesus, and Laodicea. Seven churches of Asia. The Asia is not the subcontinent, or even Asia Minor, what is now Turkey, but it's a western, in the western part of what is now Turkey, it's a Roman province. There were more than seven churches in the province, as many as ten, Troas, Miletus, some others, but the number seven had indicated a number of com completeness since the creation. Therefore, I believe the seven churches of Asia stand for the universal church to the end of time. Here we see another, on, another map of them. Periods of church history, no, I've already talked about that. I do not subscribe to the theory that each of the seven churches represents a period in church history in which the universal church is characterized by the qualities of a particular one of the seven. In other words, I do not believe the church in John's day was characterized by a loss of its first love, like Ephesus, and did not have any, to any great degree, any of the other faults seen in the other churches in chapters 2 and 3. <clears throat> Therefore, we must examine ourselves and our attitude and more necessary, more necessary, make necessary corrections in order to be pleasing to our head, Jesus. The teachings and warnings, as well as the promises and encouragements, are for us today as much as it was for the churches of the first century. As with any biblical teaching, it will benefit us only if we apply it to ourselves, not to someone else. Seven spirits. Of course, the, if the seven churches represent the universal church, I guess the seven spirits represent the Holy Spirit. The number seven, as we said, represents the universal or complete number. And as we will see in chapter 4, the seven spirits represent the one spirit of God as he works among the seven churches, meaning the universal church. The seven stars, seven spirits, seven angels, seven lamps, stand, lampstands, and seven churches are interrelated. Seven seals. Even the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls have that number because they too are related to what will affect the seven churches or the universal church down through history. The bowls are bowls of God's wrath that are poured out on the church's enemies. 
but even they affect the church indirectly by punishing her enemies. Names of Jesus in this book I have not counted all the names of Jesus in this book, but I know that just about every title or descriptive term used elsewhere in the Bible may also be found in this book. The Morning Star, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, and so forth. In verses 5 and 8 of chapter 1 are found several of these descriptive terms. Jesus is all things to his church. That's the meaning of these terms. A kingdom and priests. Christians are now part of a kingdom on earth and in heaven. And we are all saints and priests who serve in a new temple built by God and not by the hands of men as was the tabernacle in the desert and lay the temple in the earthly city of Jerusalem. Jesus is king right now and when he finishes his reign in the, at the resurrection he will no longer be king. We, find, we learn this from 1 Corinthians 15, 22-28. When his last enemy is destroyed which is death then he will turn the kingdom over to the Father and so that God may be all in all. But God Right now, God has given him to be king, the ruler over the church, until the resurrection. Notice there's a sickle. He's coming with the angels to reap the vine of the earth, and so forth. We'll see, have more to say about that later. Every eye will see him. Jesus' second coming will be visible to every person who ever lived. The Bible does not teach an invisible coming or a secret rapture, but a resurrection of the just and unjust instantly when Jesus returns in the clouds at the end of time. He will not set foot on this earth, but will catch the saints up to meet him in the air. Incidentally, that's what the word rapture means, to be caught up. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18 We will meet him in the air, then he will bring us all to God. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He began everything, he will end everything. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who what is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now that sounds like what God said, remember back in the first three, three verses? But Jesus said the same kind of thing, I think. Whose words are these? Who is this Lord God? Who is, the, who is the Almighty? From Jesus' description of himself to the church in the seven letters, he uses some of these same words to describe himself. Of course, he does have some of the same characteristics of God, some of the same powers of God, some of the same attributes. I believe these are Jesus' words and they describe him. This is his revelation. Here we have Mr. Albert Barnes, commentator. He was a historicist interpreter. That's a word a little hard to say, but it means he gave a historical interpretation to the prophecies that one event followed another. System of interpretation and outline. At this point in the introduction, I want to state my method of interpretation and give an outline of the book. My system of interpretation is the historicist or continuous fulfillment interpretation, which means that I believe one series of visions follows another in historical succession with a minimum of overlap. There's some interludes and some overlap, but basically it's a historical pro pro progression. And notice that that's underlined a different color if, if, we were white, if we were using the PowerPoint slideshow we could click on that and it would take us to the definition, but since it's a video, the hyperlinks do not work. You have to look that up. This is called the historicist interpretation. Another commentator, uh, B.W. Johnson, Barnes and Johnson, Albert Barnes, Barnes notes on the Old Testament, Old and New Testament. B.W. Johnson, People's New Testament with Notes, and Vision of the Ages are two of the commentators on Revelation that I quote most often, though they are from an earlier generation of interpreters. 
I could find no commentaries of recent times that take the historicist view. They know nothing about the two world wars. They knew nothing. Barnes and Johnson knew nothing about the two world wars or the Cold War. On this part, I was on my own. The Historicist Interpretation The historicist, historicist Interpretation takes the position that as one vision follows another, so the events seen and described in the visions follow one another historically up to chapter 10. Then there are sets of parallel visions elucidating the 100, 1260 years of the temporal power of the popes from chapter 10 to chapter 19. There are a few interludes here and there that add more data, detail, to some of the divisions, but I do not do not subscribe to the preterist or literalist interpretation. Preterist is like everything was fulfilled before the destruction of Jerusalem, and the literalist means that these are not symbols, these are literal things that happen. The locusts are real locusts and so forth. And if you don't know, understand these words, uh, look them up, please. East Gate of the Old City of Jerusalem. Of course, it's uh, bricked up. I do not wish to name or describe the various systems of interpretation. That would be a time consuming task and not necessarily helpful. I just tell my interpretation and the reasons why I interpret the symbols as I do. I also do not subscribe to the premillennialist view and the dispensational concept premillennialist Jesus is going to come to the earth and reign from the earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years and so forth and uh, this dispensational means that God has future plans for the Jews and they're going to have a special place in his kingdom I do not believe that either Israel in this book is merely a symbol of the church and Christians of all nationalities Israel itself is used as a symbol Proof of the correctness of the historicist interpretation. Okay, we there we have the beast and the false prophet. It looks like a dragon. They all go into the bottom, into the uh, lake of fire. In chapter 19, at the Battle of Armageddon, the beast and false prophet are captured and thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. But the dragon is allowed to continue, continue another thousand years. Then, the text says that after the thousand years, he is thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, quote, unquote, where the beast and false prophet had been thrown, Revelation 20.10. This shows that one series of visions follows another historically. Daniel's Prophecies I recommend the study of Daniel's Prophecies before studying Lesson 2 and beyond. I have in included four lessons on the book of Daniel on the CD. Now this is when I was sending out the CD with uh, Daniel Revelation on it. But you'll have to do that on your own. There will be references to many prophecies and symbolic language of the Old Testament in our study as we proceed. A thorough knowledge of Old Testament prophecies will help one understand the book of Revelation. Here we have an outline of the book. Prologue, the book's own introduction to itself. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. The first vision, Christ speaks. Verse 8 through 20. The seven churches of Asia are introduced. And letters are written to them. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, the seven churches. Here we have 24 elders around the throne, with gold on, sitting on thrones in white robes and with gold crowns on their heads. Seven scenes in heaven, throne scene, of the elders around the throne. The four living creatures, the cherubim, the sealed scroll, the worthy lamb, who is who can open the seal, break the seals, and open the scroll. Song of the creatures and elders. 
Song of the Angels and Song of the Universe. These are the scenes in heaven. Now, notice it's in chapters 4 and 5. Seven seals. First seal, after, after the first seal is broken, there comes out the white horse of conquest. Second seal, red horse of civil war. Third seal, black horse of famine. Fourth seal, pale horse of death by plagues and diseases. Fifth seal, a little while. Sixth seal, the day of God's wrath. The multitudes of saved. Chapter 7, 1 through 17. And seventh seal, the interlude in heaven. Seven trumpets. First trumpet, scourge of the earth. Second, scourge of the sea. Third, scourge of the rivers. Fourth, scourge of the heavens. Sun, moon, and stars. In an interlude, an eagle announces three woes. The last three are uh, called woes. The first woe is the torturing horses. The second woe, the killing horses. The little scroll and the two witnesses. The last woe, God's wrath. Seven signs. First, the birth of a man-child, the woman, and labor pains. Second, the dragon appears from the sky, the man-child's ascension, the dragon's fall, heaven's victory song, the woman's escape. Seven signs continue. Third, the beast appears from the sea as the dragon's authority. Fourth, the false prophet appears from the earth as the beast's authority. His great deception, the image he made to live, the mark of the beast. Fifth, the lamb on Mount Zion. Three angelic messengers. Sixth sign. Seventh sign, the two reapers. Seven last plagues. The heavenly singers, the seven bowls of God's wrath. First plague, sores, boils. When the first bowl is poured out, foul and painful sores came upon, come upon those bearing the mark of the beast and those who worship the image of the beast. Second bowl, the second bowl is poured out, the seas and the ocean became, a blood, became blood as of a dead man, forcing everything in the sea to die. The third bowl, rivers and the remaining sources of water turned to blood. The angels then began praising God's holy judgment, that they're just and fair. Fourth bowl, when the fourth bowl is poured out, the sun causes a major heat wave to scorch the earth with fire. The incorrigible wicked refuse to repent while they blaspheme the name of God. Fifth bowl. When the fifth bowl is poured out, a thick darkness overwhelms the kingdom of the beast. The wicked continue to stubbornly defame the name of God while refusing to repent and glorify God. Sixth bowl. When the sixth bowl is poured out, the great river Euphrates is, dries up so the kings of the east might cross to be prepared for battle. Here we see the seven last plagues. The things we've just been reading about. Six bow continued. Three unclean spirits with the appearance of frogs come out of the mouth of the beast, the false prophet. These demonic like Spirits work satanic miracles to gather the nations of the world to battle against the forces of good during the battle of Armageddon. Jesus warns those still alive during the tribulation 
that he will come like a thief in the night, urging his followers to stay alert and faithful. Seventh Bowl When the seventh bowl is poured out, a global earthquake causes the cities of the world to collapse. Every mountain and island are removed from its foundation. Giant hailstones weighing nearly 100 pounds plummet onto the planet. Remember, these are symbolic. This is not literal. These are type, mostly spiritual type things that are happening. The plagues were so severe that the wicked hatred, wicked's hatred against God intensifies while the incorrigible continue to curse God. Sight of ancient Babylon. Seven final visions. First, the prostitute, the great prostitute that sits on the seven head, ten horn, seven, yeah, seven head, ten horn beast. Second, seven songs of woe to Babylon. The angel from heaven, second voice from heaven, kings of the earth, the merchants, the sailors, the mighty angel, the multitude in heaven. Seven final visions continued. Uh, Third, the wedding supper announced. King on a white horse. The abyss in a thousand years. The dead are judged. The heavenly city. Epilogue. Closing remarks. Christ speaks. Now for some questions for discussion. The first verse says Jesus sent and signified signified it to his servant John by means of an angel. If the revelation was encoded in signs or symbolized or signified, how can it be a revelation? Let's say if you if you decode it, it becomes a revelation for you. And only those who obey, believe and obey, will be able to in, to decode it. Who was the ultimate source of the revelation? Was it the angel? Was it Jesus? Was it God? How was it transmitted from God to John? Remember, to, from God to Jesus, to the angel, to John, then to us. The letters and later we will see the entire book is addressed to seven churches. Who do the seven churches signify? Are you and I included? When Jesus returns, who will see him? Just a few or every eye? The Greek word translated soon can mean after a short time or it can mean quickly or suddenly. In view of the fact that Jesus hasn't return after 2,000 years, which meaning do you think the word has here? What is the primary purpose of the revelation? Is it to forewarn us so that we can take action to prevent the things that are predicted? Or is it after they've happened, we can look back and say, well, it, the Bible is inspired. Only God could know that. It has been said that prophecy must be important or God would not have given so much. Why did God have so much prophecy written? What is a common reason why some people avoid the study of prophecy? I hope you don't. What kind of person is most likely to understand prophecy? What kind of an attitude prepares you for the decoding of prophecy? Next, the Son of Man. In the next part of our study, we will read and discuss the vision John sees, the Son of Man, a vision of Jesus, and talk more about the symbolism of the book and introduce the letters to the seven churches. We will talk about the angels of the churches, who they might have been. Then we will begin the study of the letters to the churches. Foreknowledge and predestination. Looks like there's going to be a poem coming up here by Ellis Jones. 
Known to God are all his works from eternity past. He's with each generation, from the first one to the last. The end from the beginning, and omniscience he knows, and how to save his children while destroying his foes. He chose the saved in Jesus before the world was made. Even before creation, redemption's plan was laid. All names were in his book and were there from the start. But your name can be removed if sin corrupts your heart. He predestin predestines and predicts things that ser the things that serve his plan. He brings all things together to center in one man. Sacrifice before the world and time and space began. The Lamb of God was Jesus. That Lamb of God was Jesus. He executes God's plan. Next, Lesson 2 of 26, The Son of Man, Revelation 1, verses 9 to 20. The end. Thank you for watching. See you next time.